resolution or you just need uh, to run a meeting room for an hour, um, we have all those different options available. Uh, if anyone would like to take a tour, uh, just let me know. I can show you around. I um, also have some cards on our table back there. So thank you. Oh, and also, if you want to come in and try us out uh, for free, I mentioned your uh, Boca JS attendee. Um, you get your first week for free. Yep. Thank you. Have a good night. I used to actually work here, I've been working here for most of my, my consulting business, it's fantastic in there, this is much better than working out at home, trust me. Our next sponsor is Longest, uh, uh, with us for Longest Time, Italians, and uh, when you want to have recruiters, you've always been to every single event and it's always recruiters, recruiters, recruiters. I have something different for you. I have a developer that's a recruiter. That's a good really gift. Hey guys. I'm sorry. My name is Jason, uh, Jason Walkout. My company is Palliant, as uh, Damien said, we're an IT consulting firm, we do staffing and recruiting, and I'm also a JavaScript developer, so I'm able to actually understand what you're looking for if you're on the hiring side, or what you do if you're on the recruiting side. So come find me after, introduce yourself. Uh, I also do want to mention, we have a JavaScript job right now. So if anybody's looking, uh, we have a JavaScript developer job, it's a little bit far north, up in the Palm Beach area, but uh, come talk to me if you're looking, and uh, we'll see if it's, uh, if it's a fit. So that's it. Thanks for coming, guys. Looking forward to your talk, Leah. And thanks, Damien, for everything. In seven spaces. Thank you, You guys know uh, Leah, who's presented here before. He is part of the community, uh, a fantastic presenter, and uh, not my BS. <laughs> Everyday function working with Leah. Yeah. Thank you, Damien. Thank you, Jason. Um, I have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm just so happy to be speaking to you guys. I was actually one of the first speakers when Boca JS started back in 2014. And, uh, you know, it's been a long time since then, especially in the JavaScript world, because one year is like 20 years. But uh, it's still one of the best uh, meetups and communities in South Florida. Um, so today we're going to be speaking a little bit about functional programming. And uh, can you guys still hear me? Yeah. A little bit louder. Okay. Um, we're going to be speaking about functional programming in JavaScript, and we've had functional programming talks at Boca.js uh, before. Um, this was going to be um, sort of your, kind of your, like, like, the, like the name of the talk says, your everyday sort of functional programming. We're going to get into some more esoteric uh, concepts, but it's all stuff that it, we can all do every day to make our code as functional as possible. Um, Functional programming is a very deep and subtle subject, so it, you know, this is sort of just the introduction, and then you can really take it, um, take it from there and um, really go deep with it. A little bit about me, I'm from here from South Florida, I've been a developer since 2004. Um, I used to be mostly .NET, but I'm now mostly JavaScript, and uh, the reason for that is that I'm really excited about uh, the, the JavaScript community and what's been happening in JavaScript for the last, uh, five, six years. Um, when I, when I, you know, 10 years ago, for example, I would have never been able to predict that JavaScript would, be, would become what it is today, uh, arguably the most important language in the world at, at the moment. Um, so before I get into it, um, how many of you guys like currently practice functional programming or some aspects of it or are interested or heard of it? Okay. So some of you, okay. Not everyone, because then the talk might be like, not, not, that, uh, not that relevant. So then, uh, why do we do functional programming? Um, the crux of functional programming is that the basic unit of work in your code, or the basic atomic unit, rather, is a function, right? So unlike um, object-oriented programming, where the basic atomic unit is an object, in functional programming, it's a function. And it literally is a function, like in the classic sense, right? You have a body of code, a set of arguments and the result mapped to its arguments. So for every range of the arguments, for every iteration of, of arguments he provided, you have a predetermined output. Um, that um, essentially helps to keep that atomic unit simple. It helps to, um, to understand um, the code better. Um, and um, it helps to deal with side effects. So with object-oriented programming, for example, um, it can uh, your objects can get uh, can get crazy, and then um, things like side effects or the mutation or the behavior of your objects can can make can make it hard to develop and maintain your code. 
Um, not that that isn't a problem here, right? Because this isn't um, the mag a magic bullet. Uh, bullet. This this can also get uh, kind of hairy, but uh, there 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 is that crux, right? That basic um, concept of just a function. So yeah, unlike objects, tend to be simple and have no side effects. Um, and here's just an example of of write a function in JavaScript. This is a function that just takes in one argument, an integer presumably, and just squares that integer. So everything sort of builds on that, right? Um, and it's very easy to, to think about. It's, a, it's, a, it's very easy to grok. Um, another concept is that data in functional programming is supposed to be immutable. So in object-oriented programming, you, your object or the interface of your object or the methods in your object essentially are mutating the state inside of it. Um, and then if you want to manipulate that data, you have no choice but, but, to, but to mutate it through the interface of the object. Um, in functional programming, that's not the case. You have data that comes in and then it passes through your series of functions or through your transformations and then it, it gets you know, returned or, or spit back out. Um, and uh, that helps with, for example, with um, concurrency and again, it helps to simplify the code model. Um, another, another sort of subtle uh, goal of functional programming is to make the code declarative. So if you're writing it, um, you know, the, the proper way, I, I should say, or in an elegant way, your code almost could read like, like English. Um, and that's, in my opinion, I think a, uh, a, um, a worthwhile sort of goal to try to achieve in your code in general. Um, and here's an example. I mean, this is, this is kind of pseudo-coding, um, but uh, this is an example of a function um, that is uh, made up of other functions. And as you can see, uh, it's, you have the, a single argument, which is customers, and then it gets transformed. And then hopefully at the end, you get the results here. Um, and it reads, right, it sort of reads like English. Anyone, you write this sort of code, and then anyone who comes in after you can read it and, and very easily understand it. And so we're actually in this talk going to uh, look at some, we're gonna do some live coding, so let's see how that goes. And um, we're gonna go through refactoring sort of your normal JavaScript code that you would see um, everywhere into sort of something like this. Um, so a lot of you guys are already doing functional programming and a lot of you that didn't raise your hands are probably doing it already and not realizing it. So if you're using um, a, a frameworks like React, for example, you're essentially in the, in the functional programming world already. So if you look at React, um, the basic, what is the basic atomic unit in React, right? A component. So what is it, and what is a component? It's just a function. So you can see how the entire framework, your entire app, it's just composed of these functions. And, uh, and it works, I mean, people, uh, uh, pe obviously, you know, people are having great, uh, great success with building complicated apps this way. And really that's it, I mean, that's sort of the, the, uh, the that's really the bottom, the bottom of it, right? Like the, the, the fact that you can create very complex systems and um, with the atomic unit of, of a function. And here's an example of, of that, right? So we have the, a component, it takes, in as a, it takes in a title and the output is the markup of the title wrapped in H3. Obviously a very simple example, but just to kind of prove the point. Um, let's do, uh, so let's do some live coding and let's try to, uh, to do some refactoring and, and kind of show uh, how in your everyday work you could, you could make your code as funct uh, functional um, without really having to jump through too many hoops. So during the live coding, we're gonna uh, demonstrate a few things, uh, unit testing. So we're gonna be using Jest to run our tests. And that way, as we refactor, hopefully our tests keep passing. We're gonna refactor the code. Um, we're gonna do function composition, which is a pillar of functional programming. And that's how you sort of uh, put, put, think, put, up, put your app or your system or your, or your higher functions together. We're going to talk about what cur curry and curryable functions, both in, we're going to write some, and then we're also going to use a framework that is written entirely to, um, in, in a curryable way. Data immutability and transformation, which I mentioned before, and then um, ES6 plus. So we're going to try to write the code in the new way.
you guys, if anyone, if any of you are on your laptops and you want to follow along, you can um, go to my GitHub page, which is LeoJH. And uh, actually, uh, let's do that. GitHub. If you go to my profile, you can see repositories. Just clone this last one, and then you can follow along if you want or, or not. So I've already done that, and then we're going to run the, uh, the tests and keep them running so that we can refactor and uh, they'll keep running and passing or failing as we go. So we're going to say npm test. Oh, sure. Sorry about that. So we're going to say npm test. Uh, so we've got um, two, two test suites. Um, we're only really concerned with one, and then we have three tests that we're really concerned with. Um, so we're going to press, are you, are, you, are you guys familiar with Jest? So Jest is a, is a unit test, uh, sorry, it's a testing framework. It's sort of like if you use Mocha or Jasmine or that sort of thing. Um, it has a really cool uh, feature, which I don't know if the other ones have or not, because I haven't used the other ones in a while. But essentially, just by running the watch all, it keeps the, uh, it keeps the test running constantly. And then um, something that I've never seen before until I started using Jest is that it, it'll, if you give it the uh, option of O, It'll only run the tests that you have um, um, that you have pending commits for. So, if you, let's say you have a suite of a hundred tests, but you're only working on one or two at a time, it's very easy to just target those two. So, we'll uh, we'll try to do that. Let me open a new tab. Let me just open the editor. And so, here's the test customers test. Um, maybe we'll get to refactoring this as well. And then um, let me just show that if I change this file so that it shows that it's a, it's a pending commit, the it should have re-ran the test again. So let's see if I can kind of close this here. Or shrink this and then do that. Right? So you see that and how fast it runs. So I kind of took a tangent to tell you guys about this so that to try to encourage you to write unit tests and to, to make your tests, uh, to write as many tests as possible. It used to be that setting this up, even a few years ago, was kind of awkward, but really now it's so simple, it's so easy. There's no reason, if you're working in JavaScript, why you shouldn't be writing at least some tests. Um, so before I begin, like, does anybody have any questions about anything so far uh, before we start? Yep. Sorry? Yep. Yeah, this is like a thing that happens in every single talk. Okay. Um, any questions at all or should I just keep should I just get right into it? Just get right into it? Okay. So we have a um, an array of of uh, people, and then the, a balance is just an arbitrary number. I, I stole the names from the Silicon Valley show, so I just pretended like I'm a, uh, a, a employee of Pied Piper. <laughs> and um, so we're gonna just manipulate this data in very, you know, very easy ways. No, nothing, nothing crazy. Um, the first thing that we want to do, or the, what we want to look at, is this um, method God called get first name of my best customers. So we're using that file, right, as the, the employees of Pied Piper are the customers. And we're going to go through that file and we're going to get the best customers, so those that have a balance of over 5,000. And then we're going to take, get, get the, just extract the first name out of them. So like Leo, Ehrlich, Richard, um, strip out, you know, the last name and the balance. And then we're going to sort them. So that's it. We're just going to, we're just going to take this function and we're going to, refactor it multiple times until we get to something that's functional. So what are some of the problems with this off the bat? Like if you saw if you like inherited this code and you opened it, what would be like some of the things that pop into you pop into your head right away? The for loops? Okay. So right. The for loops. Why why is this why is this not right? Why is this not functional? Well a number of different reasons. First of all, we have state all over the place, and like I said before, part of this, part of the um, one of the main concepts or pillars of functional programming is to 
have immutable state and then to get rid of state as much as possible. So we have best customers, empty array, these counters, right, that we are mutating on every single iteration, this customer variable, and then, right, again, we're, we're mutating this array outside, that's, that even lives outside of the scope of, the, of this for loop. So how can, we, how can we rewrite this? Not you, Jason, <laughs> somebody else. One line, for each, close. Huh? Map. All right. We're going to use map. So map, we're going to, because, well, not map, sorry. Not map. Close. Remember, we're taking, we're taking um, an entire array of things. And we, we want the subset of that array. The map is going to come in later. But for this part right here. Filter. There you go. Who said that? Awesome. Filter. By the way, we're gonna we're gonna like rewrite this this entire block of code, which is how many lines? Twenty six lines, into like three or four, and it's gonna be it's gonna read better. It's gonna be just better, right? No for loops, nothing, nothing like that. Um, so let's do that. So how how do, how do I write that? Customers, that filter, right? And then it passing a lambda, and essentially just pass this in, right? We're going to do this operation inside the filter. So let's see if my tests still pass. And they still pass, right? All right. By the way, filter and map and for each and all these, what they're called the, the common higher order functions, they're not new. They actually been like, I think like even IE9 supports them. So there's a misconception about them being part of ES6 or something new, it's, it's not. Um, and this isn't just JavaScript, every single programming language now has this and they've had them for a long time. Um, in C Sharp, they're called different names. They're, like in C Sharp, it's link. Uh, but link is essentially the collection of higher functions, map, reduce, filter, for each. Um, all right, so let's keep going. We have um, the next part, which is gonna be map which somebody, you said. So let's, ref let's refactor this. Best customers. Uh, map. Again, C for customer. C that first name. So let's see, save, and, and the test still pass. So this is starting to take shape, but I mean, this is still very, uh, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not there yet. Um, it's not there yet because we still have some state. Um, so let's keep let's keep going. We can we can take best customers and um, and and pipe the map and the filter. Um, that will take us one step there, but still not quite all the way. But let's do that. So we can say let's refactor best customers to best customers first names. Let's do that. Let me indent this. Let's say, actually, let's say here, right? Problem is, like now I lost my reference. Now I lost my reference, so then I have to just put it back here, right? And the test failed. Why did it fail? Oh, because first names. Yeah. And there you go. And they're passing. Um, let me jump ahead here a little bit. Okay. Any, everybody following so far? Yeah, pretty easy. So um, let's keep going. The sort I can actually get rid of, um, or not get rid, um, or just uh, I think if I just do sort like this, it'll it'll still keep the. Uh, the correct sorting. Yeah. That's just because sort is also a member of the array object in JavaScript. Um, I think I think if you like take code like the one that was that we had before to this, I think you're like 90% there. I mean this obviously this right I mean 
if you compare this to what we had to begin with, does anybody does anybody think does anybody think this is better? Does anyone not agree with refactoring from this sort of imperative procedural code to something like this? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is basically, how do you debug this, right? So it's a very good question because you are giving up power. The, the, presume the presumed advantage of writing code in a procedural way is that you're, you're telling the computer or you're telling the, the you're, you're writing the code in how the, in how the code should behave. Um, but this way, you're, you're telling the computer what to do, not how to do it, right? So you do lose some power. Um, but it's still very easy to, in, for, with something with this code in particular to still debug this code or troubleshoot it. I mean, you can, for example, split that out, split this into a into a block of code, right? And then put a debugger on here, right? Put a debugger statement on here, or put a or put a or log, and then still be able to see like what's going on in the pipeline. So absolutely, it's still it's still you're still able to. To, to troubleshoot and debug your code and see and get it to get to the internals of it. But a very good question for sure. So easy easy refactoring. Um, the next thing I'm going to show and, and we're going to keep refactoring this is um, um, uh, functional composition. We're going to I'm going to introduce a, a framework called Randa which is, if you've never heard of use Randa, it's, it's similar to like load dash or, or, um, or underscore. It's the JavaScript utility uh, function library, but it's written in a functional way. Um, if, you, if you use load dash and you, uh, and you, and you can also use uh, load dash FP, FP for, for functional programming, and it's similar to this. The, the difference is that in, unlike regular load dash or underscore, where you pass in the data first, and then the function after or the operation after, you reverse that, right? So in Lodash, if you want to do map, you do something like dot map, right? Your function, right? And then the data. In Randa and in functional, in Lodash FP and in functional frameworks, it's the other way around. You do it like this. And there's a, there's a reason why. It's because every function is curryable. And we're going to get into what a curryable function is. But let me, uh, let me pull up Randa and then um, show you some of the, uh, the most common uh, sort of uh, methods that, that we use. It does have a bunch of functional uh, concepts or functional um, utility functions. I'm not going to get into those now because this is a very, uh, this can, this can get, this is a deep subject. But uh, we have all the we have all the right, all the normal high order functions that we're uh, that we're already accustomed with and we already did in the example map um, filter um, find and uh, and many others. There's equality functions, things like that. But we're going to use something called compose, which is a way to which is sort of the um, one of the main concepts in functional programming, which lets you make one function out of many different smaller functions and that is no difference uh, no different than for example in react if you if you use redux and use connect then you wrap and then you you, you sort of like uh, uh, wrap your function component into the connect function and then you keep building things that way it's similar um, compose is essentially the same as doing this um, let's say, for example, it's it's a, it's a, it's the same as calling one function inside the other. So if we have um, I don't know bar and functions, and then you have right I don't know uh, function one, and then function one calls function two, uh, function three, right? The order of operation here is function three gets called, then function two, then function one. By using compose, you can kind of separate this out 
and then write it like this. So that it reads sort of in sequence except backwards. If you don't like the backwards thing, you can use pipe. But since, you know, since we're computer nerds, we like to do things backwards. So we're gonna use compose. That's what all the, what all the kid, uh, cool kids use. So let's try, to, let's try to write this, right, using compose. So we're gonna import compose from Randa, right? So now we have the compose function available to us. Um, compose is going to return a function, so we're going to get rid of this as a function. We're going to say that this is equals compose, right? And let me just get rid of this. Let me cheat here a second. Actually, no, let me not cheat. Um, in this way, things are going from top to bottom, but in Compose, like I said, it's backwards. So we're, we're going to start with the filter, and we're just going to copy these, sort of like, copy and paste these. Yeah, let's do it like this. Let's do it like this. And then sort. Let's, let's do this. Um, because these are also standalone functions, I have to import them, and I'm going to import them from Randa again. So we're going to say import sort, compose sort, map, filter. Um, the tests may not be passing. Let's see. Yeah, they're not passing anymore. I should be sorting. I missed a step here in the middle. I, the example that I wrote is like the, all the way through. Um, but let me see if I can troubleshoot this. Expect the function to get to the value view and then return the function. Let me just keep going. I, I'm, I'm not going to be able to, like, I don't have the crutch <laughs> that I normally have. Um, but anyway, the, 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 the purpose is, or the, the, the point is that you can sort, you can write, um, you can start composing your functions like this together. Um, something that we can, um, something that we can do even, um, we can go even further is utilize Ramda even more to start sort of abstracting these things out so they're, they're not, they're, they're done by the, by the library for you. So with, um, and if we, if we look at the example that I have, the final example, it sort of has, right, it's like the last, uh, it's, it's, the, it's the last step in, in what the refactoring would look like. So as you can see here, um, we don't have any more like sort of code that we wrote ourselves. Um, we it's all using the um, the methods that uh, provided by Randa, and so we still have you know it still looks sort of the same. But instead of saying map like this like we had it before, right? With C C that first name, we uh, we use a pr the prop method in Ram in Ramda to take take the prop out of the the uh, the, the um, sorry, the customer object, the sort by, and then the filter. The filter here is, is a little more complex, and it's just to prove the point. A lot of this is, for this example, is overkill, but it's just to prove the point that um, to do filter, you have to then compose the function inside a filter. So you have to say, give me the prop balance out of the customer's object that you're iterating through. If it's greater than 5,000, right, then return, then return that 
that object. If not, then uh, then don't. And so, and so, this you know this this is, I guess you would say like, the most functional way to write this very simple piece of logic, right? Um, again, overkill, not not uh, not probably the way that that you know that you probably should. Something like uh, even you know something like we had before with the uh, with the pipe commands or the compose without all the Randa um, without all the Randa um, um, artifacts would probably be good enough. But it's just to show you like how deep you can take this thing. And hopefully my tests are passing, but maybe they're not. Let's see. This happened to me in my last talk too. I don't know. Like at home, the tests always pass. <laughs> there you go, they're passing now. That's, I just missed the, uh, the imports. Um, something that may not, that when you look at this, something that may not be obvious is that every part of this compose and every part of, of this block of code is made up of other functions. And everything in here returns a function. So prop.balance is a function and it returns a function that when you call it with the object, it gives you back the balance property, right? Same thing with greater than. Greater than is a function, but it also returns another function. Same thing with compose, right? Compose is a, is, is a function clearly, because we're calling it from the test directly um, by running, by, by calling this, this um, get first names of my best customers. So this proves the point that the code is made up by making up a lot of little functions that do one thing and one thing only, and they return another function. And then when the chain gets called all the way up, at the end, it executes, right? So it's not, they're all naturally deferred, um, and they are all atomic, and then they only execute right when all the, all the things are, uh, are, um, are satisfied. The last